And we are going to now dig into Infrastructure Services Foundation. I'm David. Awesome. And I'm David. And here we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, if we want to switch to the slides. We can, uh, can get going here. Windows Azure loves IT professionals. That's correct. Yes. But I couldn't eat a whole one. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, the agenda for this, you know, the goal really as a whole for this module is to get you familiar with all of the fundamentals you need to start building stuff on infrastructure as a service. Um, walking through subscriptions, affinity groups, virtual networks, storage disks, cloud services, virtual machines, image images and managing virtual machines. This is a lot to pack into the next 45 minutes or so, but uh, so stay tuned here. All right, first off, we're going to dive right into a demo. Uh, we're going to talk about subscriptions, roles, and uh, increasing our limits, right? Absolutely. OK. Um, so let's, uh, <clears throat> let's dig in here. First off, I want to, you know, there's some questions on the trial. How do we get the trial? What does that look like? Go to windowsazure.com, try it for free, try it for free here, yes. And we probably want to see the, the yay. There we go. So here's what you get, right? Uh, you get you get 750 small compute hours. For those of you who are wondering, like, what is the math on that? Uh, 744 hours is a month, right? If you have a 31-day month running constantly. So effectively, you could run a small compute instance for the entire month constantly, and you'd be you'd be good on the compute hours. Now, um, the other the other thing that sometimes people run into or got to be cautious of is the storage. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. But generally speaking, you know, it gives you enough to, to kind of play around with, uh, with Windows Azure. And uh, <clears throat> I won't continue on with the trial, but just, you know, you just need to click through there uh, to, to get your trial set up. Any, any things you wanted to say on that? No? No, I, I think, you know, the, the free trial gives you enough to kind of get going and try some of the things out. And, yep. and to, yeah. totally the way to, to go and look at it. And, and once you start adopting, you can switch between paying for things up front, paying for things in you know, six months or, or 12 months, but also we have a kind of uh, a way for our enterprise customers to consume Azure through the enterprise agreement as well. So always keep that in mind. You don't need to be paying all the time on a credit card. Um, once you, you kind of think, oh my gosh, I've got to really use this, you can go and talk to your, the, your Microsoft team and, and have part of your enterprise agreement to, to consume Azure and you get some great price bricks and everything um, through that. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point out, if you want to switch back to my to my machine here, is is that um, there is a pricing calculator um, to if you want to give a rough estimate of of you know what it might cost you depending on your workload. So, for instance, virtual machine, what are your sizes, and then also uh, you know we have different options for uh, pay as you go. Um, or paying in six month or 12 month uh, premiums, and this is regardless of your support contract, which gives you right uh, a little bit of savings uh, up front if you, we know you want to buy in, in, in bulk. With that, I'm going to dig into the first subscription here. I, I've logged in, and when you first log in, uh, give you some familiarity with, with uh, the, the console. Uh, up top here, you'll notice we have uh, subscriptions. Um, you also have the live ID that you signed in with and this little globe icon. So we're going to walk through those right now. First off, with subscriptions, this is all the subscriptions that you have access to um, via your Live ID, and I'll show you how you add those here in a second. Um, the languages, pretty straightforward on the right, and then um, on, the, on the far right, you can see your Live ID, and here uh, there's an interesting option which says View My Bill. We're going to click on that, and I'm going to have to type my password again. And inside of here, you're going to have an idea of um, what your billing looks like, right? So um, inside of here, you would have the ability to see, uh, right, the, the account history, the, uh, the, the prices that you have. And by default, the 90-day trials and your MSDN subscription is going to limit what you, uh, limit you so you don't hit any charges on your card, right? And that's a really important thing to point out. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so we ask yeah. for a credit card just to make sure you're you're a person. Yeah, that's and and a phone number, right, for that same yeah. type of reason. Absolutely. So, 
All right, so let's keep on let's keep on going it, with it this. It really likes you putting that password in, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, this is a this is a separate separate account there. Um, so so that's where the billing is at, right? And um, let's let's keep on moving with with the where you set the the administrators and how do you get access to Windows Azure? Uh, if you go into settings, okay, down at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Uh, of your, your management console, you'll see there's there's a few different options. One is management certificates, um, and the other is administrators. So with management certificates, right, these you can upload your own, or as uh, David will show you here in the next module with PowerShell, you can run a command and it'll auto generate a certificate for you to have access. Um, and this is also the main way in which many of the services, such as System Center, uh, connect up to your Windows Azure subscription using those certificates. The next option is under administrators. And here you can see that uh, we have, uh, you can just add a live ID. So if you go down here, add, and then type in an email address, blah, blah, at hotmail.com, and choose which subscription you want to have somebody access. <laughs> Does that really exist? I, you know, it might, is it? but it does not. Because you know, if you click on OK, they, do they get an email? They might. <laughs> that would be funny. That would be. That just would some be random good. person's like, hey, welcome blah, to Blah, blah, blah. I'm oh. sure there's some person that signed up yeah. for the blah, blah at hotmail.com and they get all <laughs> kinds of random sign up requests. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, but what you can do is you, you click next, right? And in the, obviously, it's not really doing any kind of validity checks here other than, like, checks, if, I type, if I don't type yeah. a .com, right, it'll, it'll have a, a, an issue. Yeah. Or if I remove, let's say, for instance, the at sign, of course, it's going to yeah. say, yeah, that's not a valid email address. Totally. Um, we click OK. I'm not going to click OK because I don't want blah, blah to have access to my no, account. No, not really. Uh, but once you do that, right, it shows up in the console. And at that point, you know, that person can log into manage.windowsazure.com. Um, if, we, if we go up here, right, uh, manage.windowsazure.com is your main site that you're going you're gonna to access Windows Azure. You can get there. If you go to windowsazure.com, there's a link on there to, to get to, their, to the main management portal as well. But that's, that's a really quick tour of just getting started logging into Windows Azure. OK, let's go back to the slides and talk about affinity groups. Ooh, Ooh affinity groups. Huh? Oh, I have an affinity for that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Let's, this, uh, is, this is now in two days. We're going to do this in two days. Yeah. No, come on. No, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a duplicate of, of this entire presentation now. Um, so what we have here is the affinity groups. And what you'll notice is that um, the affinity groups, you know, Windows Azure has resources in a number of different places, right? And it looks like my slideshow is set to uh, continue to, to transition infinitely. <laughs> Because <laughs> it uh, needs you to so go it, faster. It does like, need me to go, go faster. Keep, keep, keep it gonna, going. Keep it up five second transitions. Yeah, so, okay, I think we're good now. <laughs> um, so, the affinity groups, right? Windows Azure has the, the, when you deploy something, whether it's a VM, a storage, whatever that happens to be, you've got this sea of machines, right? And when you click deploy, that could go into a number of different places. Of course, there is data centers. And there's that kind of scope, but obviously there's thousands of servers within that same data center, yeah. right? Well, Affinity Group is a way in which we help you to kind of keep those resources together in our overall, you know, fabric of, of stuff we have going on yeah. in the cloud. Why do we care about that? Well, you still deal with physics, right? You still yeah. want things to be close together on the same cluster. So Affinity Group just tells Windows Azure, like, hey, we'd like to keep this stuff in the same kind of part of the building. Um, you know, when you, when you use um, skateboards and things to get around the data center, um, you don't want two machines that need to talk to each other being, you know, physically separated by quarter mile. So Affinity Group just brings everything together. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, that's Affinity Group. So we'll show you how to, to create those here in a second. But let's talk now about the virtual networks because that's a really important one for really almost anything that you're going to do as it relates to virtual machines. When we look at VPNs, um, we now have two different options, and we'll and we'll dig into those later. But at a at a core uh, essential concept here, right? You are connecting your Windows at your site uh, on premise up to Windows Azure um, using a VPN, 
right? So this will allow you to do a lot of different scenarios as you architect things. And also, the virtual network inside of Windows Azure is, is kind of a logical boundary for networking. So when you create a virtual network, it's a way for you to kind of group those resources together yeah. on the network inside of Windows Azure. Okay. Um, supported VPN device list. I bring this up um, because just for those of you to know that there's a lot of different devices supported, there's, you know, this is not necessarily a comprehensive list of everything that works. In fact, at my house, I even use uh, <laughs> Threat Management Gateway that is not on any kind of supported list, <laughs> and it happens to work. Um, but that's, but, that's yeah. because it supports the, right. the kind of requirements on the bottom of the slide that's right. there, right? Absolutely, yeah. right. And that's because it supports those generic VPN devices. Yeah. Um, and we also re release support officially for Windows Server 2012 uh, and uh, that is something that we'll, uh, David will dig into later. All right, I'm going to do heavy demo here, and we're going to jump back over to the Affinity Groups and Virtual Networks. And let's, let's go there. So first off, uh, right, what we want to do is go in and create ourselves a, a new Affinity Group. All right, and... <clears throat> You'll notice also <clears throat> there's a number there's a number of places that this shows up, but but it also shows up on the the services uh, <clears throat> at the very bottom of the screen. So you see here there's affinity groups up top, and we're just going to click on that. And here we click add, choose a name. I'll just say the the David Affinity Group because that's what we're that's what we're doing today. I'll choose my subscription, and I want it in the West U.S. because that's closest to where I happen to be at right now. We'll click OK. And that's really it, right? Nothing, nothing uh, super crazy about an affinity group, but what that's saying is that anything that's inside of that affinity group, I want it to reside inside of the West U.S. Uh, data center, right? So pretty straightforward, pretty basic. And you're going to see the affinity group pop up into a number of different places as we, as we go through here. All right, that's the affinity group, pretty simple. Next is the virtual networks. And what do we do here? Well, we're going to just go through, create a new virtual network. Uh, networks, virtual network. And one of the cool things about the consoles, if you choose wherever you're at and you click new, it assumes, it thinks, hey, oh, I realize that you're in virtual networks. You might want to create one of them. That's kind of handy there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go to virtual network, and we'll do a custom creation of a virtual network. And here, this is going to be the name of the network you want to have. Um, and I will say the David, the David VNet. <laughs> That's thank, right. Thank you. Oh, yes. No. Oh wait. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, we click next. Right in the back here, we choose which affinity group it, it wants to be in. And because we chose the David affinity group earlier, we'll pick that one and click Next. Then we have the option for DNS servers. Now, at this time, we have the ability to modify your DNS servers after the fact, but this is uh, one that you, you want to think about because what this does, because Windows Azure uses all DHCP that has 99-year leases, so it's kind of like static, <laughs> uh, the, the first IP address in your virtual network is going to be whatever that subnet is, dot four. Okay, and a lot of times people want that first server in your virtual network to be a DNS server or a domain controller. Um, in this case, I will, I will go ahead and choose a uh, Azure DC01. And in that, in that uh, guy, I'm going to choose 10.0.10.4. On the right-hand side, what you can see is two different options for virtual networks. You can configure these later. There's no need to do this right away. The newest one is this point to site connectivity one. And in that one, you are uh, going to be able to do a lot of different options. And David's going to dig into that later. And then the site to site connectivity one is the one we've had for quite some time with your traditional VPN devices. Absolutely, yeah. OK. All right, so we'll click Next. And then here is where we're going to choose our, our address space. I tend to not use the count. <laughs> Because I don't know who 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 knows uh, those long you numbers you there. You mean you don't know the count? <laughs> the count. <laughs> I, I happen to not know the count, but 
Cider, on the other hand, I like cider. Cider's good to drink. Cider's a good drink. It's a good drink, yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. that going to do with subnets? Well, it's classless interdomain routing, right? My goodness. Come on, gosh. Come on, David. Get with the program, right? Yeah, no, I know. I feel humbled by your knowledge of that. <laughs> I gl when I see the subnets, I kind of go and gloss over. Yes, yeah. yes. So we are going to use a cider mask of, in my case, I'm going to choose 16 bits. Mm. Nice. There we go. Right? 16-bit cider. 16-bit cider. And, uh, you know, this is something you do want to think about because if you choose, let's say, for instance, an 8-bit mask, then you're not going to be able to create uh, any other sub-subnets or new virtual networks, I should say, that use, that are anything under that class because it says, oh, I already have a subnet under that, that yeah. listing. So something you want to think carefully about as you choose uh, what, you, what you want there. I'm going to choose 10.0.0. And actually, I'll choose 10. Yeah. And then we'll choose the new subnet and we'll call it subnet 10. Right? And then we'll choose a 24 bit mask. And when we click next or click OK, it's going to fire that up, right? It's going to fire up a new virtual network. Sweet. So there we go. We have a new virtual network. And instead of waiting for that one to finish, I happen to have a existing <laughs> virtual. Oh, there it is. So, well, it did finish. See, that's the power <laughs> of the cloud. That is the power of the cloud. I do that so many times. I'm like, here's one I did earlier, and then the and one I've just done. created is done. It's like, <laughs> yeah. now I feel really awkward. You're like, oh, OK. Well, never mind. <laughs> we have that already. So I'm going to go to the, if it would actually show up here, huh? uh, we're going to go to the demo VNet. And in there, You've got your friendly dashboard on how to use it, right? The, your, your quick start little cloud icon. But after that, we have uh, the dashboard of what, what that virtual network looks like. Once it comes up here, we will dig in. OK. Um, on the dashboard, it tells you what resources are assigned there. In this case, we have nothing assigned because it's a blank network. And when you go in to configure that virtual network, you can see that um, the, the DNS server that you specified there is available. You can also change whatever it is that you, you wanted to, to, to fix. OK, we just had that switch up on me all of a sudden. Let's go over to the David VNet. Um, here you have the option right to choose site-to-site -site connectivity or point-to-site. Yep. And that's what we'll, we'll open up later for the, for the connectivity. But regardless of even if you don't use the site-to-site -site VPN or you're never planning on doing that, it's really wise to use this virtual network because you have the ability to control the DNS and the IP addresses that your machines get when they boot up into your Absolutely, network. Absolutely, yeah. And that is a, a really important factor. The other thing uh, to think about here is, right, you can go and look at the list of the DNS servers in the virtual networks or the local networks which you might use for the VPN side of things. Yeah. Okay. With that, I'm going to, I think, go back to the slides. It's yeah. kind of the essentials of of the virtual network. And we're going to keep coming back to networking as we, we show kind of these things being used in scenarios. So we'll, we'll kind of keep pulling back the onion there. Yep. Let's keep it going. All right. Well, uh, the first thing I want to talk about here is the virtual networks. And again, it's giving me presenter view. So, <laughs> so storage and disks, right? Uh, that's the next thing. We've, we've got this network or this container of networking to have things, but now, right, we need to store stuff. So imagine that. Surprise, surprise. Surprise. And this is almost the same as if you were setting up a branch office or something, right? You go in and the, you don't go in and, and build a server because the first thing you do is get the network put in. And then the next thing you do is think about, well, what's my storage solution going to be? So this is exactly the same. That's right. And you know, give you an idea, there's two main disk types that are supported inside of Windows Azure. You've got your operating system disk, which supports up to 127 gigabytes. And we have a data disk, which is up to one terabyte in size. On the, the drive letters, and you'll see this when we, we kind of later as we go through uh, the Active Directory module, but there's a D disk, which is a non-persistent cache drive. <laughs> That's for all virtual machines. Yeah. So, let it be known, <laughs> do not store anything on that drive. Yeah, right? the, the, the because, D drive just yeah. lives on the hardware. It never goes back to, it lives on the, the hardware where the, the virtual machine is running. It never goes back to the storage system. So it's great for page files or anything that's throwawayable. 
Is that a word? Fro <laughs> throw away a bow. It is now. It's in the English dictionary. <laughs> there it is. It's I would been defined. Um, so it's not good to install applications on the D drive because um, if we have to move you to a different piece of hardware or you change the machine size, that, that D drive is going to get trashed and you get a brand new one. So think of it, you get a brand new D drive every time you start. There you go. There you go. And uh, with caching, this is different than the non-persistent uh, disk, yes. right? <laughs> because within each of the disks that you have, you have the ability for a caching setting on that disk. And uh, this is really important to think about as it relates to performance, as well as if you have a particular database such as Active Directory um, that needs to not have that cache potentially yeah. cause issues yeah. uh, and setting that appropriately. Okay. Disk caching, right? As we dig into this next one, you can set that using the the PowerShell commands or using the GUI. And with that, I think we are going to to go to what happens with these disks, yeah. right? Because if you get this virtual machine, where is that a, where is that stored at inside this overall disk storage subsystem? Well, by default, bonus, you get. A lo the locally redundant storage is your lowest common denominator. So yeah. at a bare minimum, you're going to get your storage or your virtual machine stored across three different drives in that same data center. Yeah. So there's three copies of every VHD that you have in there, and we keep them perfectly in sync. And, and the reason for this is when you, when you have thousands and thousands of servers, there's a guarantee something's probably failed right now. And we're probably moving someone's third copy to another place to, to keep it running. So there's always things going on like that. So to help keep your data available, we have three copies of it. And the chance of us losing all three copies at the same time is pretty, pretty slim. Um, so this keeps you running um, all the time. And you don't notice when we lose a copy because we just quickly rebuild the third copy and we keep you kind of running there. Um, but it's a peace of mind. But it gets even better, doesn't it, David? It does. Oh, wait. But wait, there's, but wait, more. there's more. But wait. <laughs> it's like an info commercial. Wait, there's <laughs> <Yeah>. more. <laughs> well, if we go to our slides, <laughs> we can see that, oh, you just click a button, and literally, even within Windows Azure, it is that simple. Click, I want geo-redundant storage. And at that point, you're now making three additional copies in a data center that's at least, what, 300 miles yeah. apart from wherever you're at? And that way, in case the entire data center gets, let's say, blown up or something, yeah. <laughs> right? You still have your data in wherever that other uh, uh, data center location yeah. is at, right? After that, we also have additional redundancy in the, the kind of compute side of the virtual machines, right? So under the hood, if we have, let's say, a Hyper-V host that's running a virtual machine die, we have that thought of as well. Yeah. <laughs> that comes up on another, another virtual machine. You don't even really... You know. And, and th this is so automated that you, you probably see it as a reboot, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, if we have a hardware problem and the server goes down, we just replace, we put your, your workload on a different server and keep you going. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how to be highly available in a virtual machine environment. Um, but for now, we, you know, just know that y you never have to apologize because of a hardware failure, because we're just going to take care of that. Um, for you. That's right. That's right. Okay. And with that, I think we are going to show you a little bit about storage and the disks, what yep. that looks like inside of your console. Let's go right into Windows Azure and fire up the console here. The first thing you might want to do is go to storage and we're going to create a new storage account inside of our subscription. We go to storage, quick create. You'll notice over here that you have the core.windows.net as your domain name. And this does need to be a unique domain name because there's a yeah. lot of different things um, that reference that domain name and its uniqueness for all kinds of Azure services. In this case, I'm going to choose David Storage. Maybe that's available. No, fail. Okay. I think David, I already own David Storage. <laughs> How about David Storage Demo? Maybe, thinking about it. Well, that's, oh yes, David Storage Demo. We've got that, and then we will choose the David Affinity Group, because it's all about David today. Yeah, it's all about you. <laughs> oh, no, me. Be, oh, wait, oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> so then, you have at the bottom here, right, this is your checkbox of geo-replication. 
Okay, so here you can see um, that literally that is the only checkbox you need in order to do what we just showed you in the slide, which is replicate three copies of it in a in another data center. I'm going to uncheck it. It's going to give me the warning saying, "Hey, can have a later can have a pricing impact." Yes, it's going to be cheaper if I do not <laughs> if I do not ge geo replicate. We'll click OK, and now it's going to spin up a storage account. The reason why this is important. Um, is because you might not want, if you go through to create a VM, you might not want the automatically generated portal name. It's going to be portal and then a random yeah. bunch of string characters. And they're <laughs> and all it, named in that s same way. So right. it, once you've got a couple of them, it just, it's you, like having two Davids present, right? You're not quite right. sure which one. You're just it. confused. Like, who is, wait, where who is, is my stuff? David? Who's that David guy? I yeah. don't know. Yeah. That's uh, a film. Who is David? Who is that? It's I, don't not, I, don't. I don't know. Anyway, all right. So uh, if we keep going here and we dig into a storage account, let's uh, give you a peek at what that looks like. Um, you'll notice that when you log into the dashboard, you've got down here at the bottom three kind of major options, right? Blobs, tables, and queues. For the IT pro folks that are out there, you're probably only going to really typically care about blobs because that's really like your file storage. Um, and with your file storage, uh, right, that's going to be where your VMs are. Uh, my Zoom's getting a little crazy there. Uh, that's where your VMs are going to be at. That's also where you can store whatever files you happen to, to care about. Um, the tables and queues is going to be typically for a developer, right, to have some kind of application to write to, right? Um, and that's really beyond the scope of our, our chat today. But nonetheless, um, just be aware of, of that. And then you can also see, of course, on the right-hand side, you can see, you know, is the status online? Is geo-replication enabled? Um, which affinity group is that is that stored in? Which subscription is that storage account stored in? And then from there, uh, what you can go to is the the configuration. So if we go into configuration, you have some options as well. And configuration, you have the ability to geo-replicate and turn that on or off at any time you see fit. Um, and then you have the option to monitor. The reason why we don't turn this on by default is because it does, of course, put that into your Windows Azure storage, yeah. right? <laughs> You're going to now get charged for storing those logs Absolutely. on inside of your storage account, which gives you monitoring. And we don't want to force you to, into that. Um, but it is there if, in case you need to do some kind of debugging or, or deeper information about your, your underlying disk structure, right? Um, and you can choose, of course, here which type of which type of requests you want to log inside of there. Um, I'm not going to log this. It's it's uh, not super exciting. Wow, it's, no, a, it's, it's a it's a it's a storage log. It's like wow. a log. Yeah, <laughs> yay, right? Um, and then the last part I want to I want to switch to is containers. This is some place you probably will use at some point because you want to know what's inside of what's inside of my storage, right? What is what is in there? When we go into VHDs, um, which is the default folder that uh, Windows Azure automatically creates when you, when you provision a VM, you can see here I've got a number of different VMs in my environment, including and, and, and the size. These, these are a proprietary format, right? That isn't used anywhere else, right? Th these are a special Azure format, right, David? Uh, yeah, VHD. Huh, I've never heard of that before. I, I think some, some product uses VHDs. What, what's know. that? Hyper something. I don't know. Hyper D? Hyper D. Hyper T, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Hyper D, the, the new hyper virtualization D. software. But, yeah. VHD is the format that we use in all of our virtualization technology right. and have done for, for a number of years. It's not a special Windows Azure format. So you can take VHDs and, and upload them, and they're going to work in Windows Azure. And you can take right. VHDs and create them in Windows Azure and download them onto your, your machine and run them on Hyper-V. You know? Right, there's no conversion that's needed. And that's one of the unique things or advantages of, of our service is that it's pretty seamless, right? You VHDs from on-premise with Hyper-V up into Windows Azure, no conversion needed, or even service providers we have that are out there that will support this as well. So you're not spending time converting stuff. We're also not locking you in in case you happen to have, let's say, a data disk or something, other weird restrictions, like you can't yeah. get it out. You can pull out whatever you want. Whatever you put in, you can pull out, run it locally, back and forth, however you see fit. Totally, right? yeah. Okay, I think we've hit do that we, one, hit that a, one hard. <laughs> do we need to address VHDX? VH, yeah, we should. Yeah. So we VH, should. VHDX is usually a question we get. Well, do we support VHDX? 
No, no. not yet. No, <laughs> unfortunately not yet. Well, that's that covered. Uh, well, Let's that's we got that covered. In case you asked that already, I don't know if you did, but probably somebody somebody did. I know that's something we're looking into. <laughs> I know that's something. Absolutely. I know it's something, coming. Yeah, it's it's coming, but for now, no, just VHDs. We also only support static VHDs. Um, at this time, and if you upload a dynamic VHD, it will convert it to a static yeah. for you automatically. And the other thing to point out as far as storage utilization is that we only take, we only account for the storage that you're, you're using. Uh, meaning like, is there ones on the disk, right? Because if, uh, if you have a disk, let's say that's 120 gig dynamic VHD, and you only have 20 gigs of one out data on there, it will show up in Windows Azure as a 120 gigabyte disk, but what you're being charged for is only that 20 gigabytes in size. So that really helps if in case you're worried about, you know, let's say on your trial accounts or things like that, hitting your storage limit, it's not as bad as you might think, right? <laughs> it's not scary. Yeah. You, should, you should be okay. Um, if we want to switch back to my demo machine, uh, I'll just give you a quick couple other things on, on containers here. Uh, when we look at this, right, you have the ability, it shows you where this VHD is stored at. It shows you the size when you last modified that, um, and gives you the ability to copy, right, of course, the, the, the URL of that disk. And um, within there, right, there's also a number of other tools that you have. I don't have any on my machine right now, and I'll just say there's a number of third-party tools that are out there that allow you to connect up to the storage. So you could, if you like and you want that drag-drop functionality of, of moving data in there, you can do that. Yeah. Now, you don't want to do that if you're planning on moving VMs. In which case, David will help you on, yeah, on how, to, how to make that, that happen, right? Um, with that, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and go back to the slides again. And we are going to continue on with the presentation. Okay. There we go. So we have uh, virtual machines and cloud services, right? Um, and this is kind of the next building block, right? We've created an affinity group. We've created a virtual network. We yeah. have a storage account. It's 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 building up right now to we have this. Yes, we're ah, finally going to create got a virtual, virtual machine. machine. Woo! Yeah. Hey, <laughs> right? There's one thing you need to understand first, though, which is that virtual machines have to be installed installed inside of a cloud service. So that's a new term, right? Ooh, yeah. cloud service, right? Well, a cloud service, right, is just a kind of a logical boundary for you to have management. Also, from a, a, an IT guy's perspective, you get one public IP address per cloud service. So yeah. that's the way in which you and Azure and everything else knows how to access or, or get to those particular resources behind there. Yeah. Uh, and you also, right, can have multiple VMs inside of this, the same cloud service. Totally. So you can keep going with that cloud service. A cloud service is separate from the virtual network, to be clear. Um, but, but let's keep going with that analogy, right? Um, this is, and we're not going to dig into all the details of this specific example, but this gives you an idea of various kinds of architectures that you might have, right? You can have multiple cloud services talking to each other inside of one virtual network, perhaps and having um, those VMs live inside of the cloud service uh, with all different kinds of connectivity options there. Totally. And, and the thing to remember with the cloud service is that you don't have to necessarily worry about creating them. We're going to create them as you create virtual machines and as you join virtual machines together. So we're telling you because when you go to the portal, it's going to have, virtual it's going to have cloud services appearing and you're going to go, I didn't create one and then you're going to try and delete it, and it's not going to let you delete it because it's connected to a bunch of VMs. Right. And then everyone goes, I don't understand this Windows Azure thing. It's really confusing. What's this cloud service What's thing? What's this cloud service um, thing, yeah. But now you don't because you know. Now you know, right? And we're going to show you in a demo to give you more yep. visuals on the cloud service as yep. it relates to the virtual machines. Uh, let's, let's get into that right now. Okay. Uh, we'll go to our virtual machine console here. And and here we've I've already have a number of different virtual machines running, but let's just assume, you know, because we we have the service and we have a new virtual network, we want to create our first virtual machine on our new virtual network that we've created and storage account. We'll go to a new virtual machine from Gallery, and there you've got a lot of different options, right? You've got a, 
for the for the gallery images. You've got SQL, a number of Linux options uh, in the in the list. I'm just for this the purposes now. What I'm did you just say? Linux. What do you mean we that's, have Linux? We have Linux virtual machines oh available. Oh my gosh, we, in the fact, world has, has ended. That's right, we, you see, we have penguins. <laughs> we have penguins. Ah, they've invaded Windows Azure, Open Logic, Ubuntu. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, Suse. Ah, but, no. But hang on a minute, we're, we're, we're Microsoft. We don't, we don't build these images, right? We right. don't, we don't, we don't. We have a great uh, partnership, right? With, yeah. with, with folks who go and build these. So totally. it's so, not so because canonical. I don't know how much you trust Microsoft, yeah. right, to build a Linux. It, it would be the slowest that, Linux distro that, on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. But, but Canonical build the Ubuntu distribution. So you're getting not a, a Microsoft funny version, you're getting a, a, a real Canonical Ubuntu version that's totally supported by them. You can call them up and, and, and get support on that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's jump back into the demo, and we'll keep going with creating our virtual machine. We'll choose Windows Server. Uh, for the virtual machine name, we'll say the, the David VM. Uh, you know, we got to keep that theme going, right? Um, and, and now we have a number of options, right? And with the general availability, we, we announced two more options, this A6 and A7. Right, because the T-shirt sizes starts to not work anymore once you <laughs> once you. It, it does, yeah. and and it was fun naming them. And yeah. and A6, a lot of people go, oh, A must mean something, and six must mean something. They don't. <laughs> yeah. In case you were wondering, they don't mean anything. No, and and we toyed with calling these high memory SKUs, mm -hmm. but you know it's 56 gig of memory now. But like in three years' time, might that be the small instance? Right. So. Trying to tie that to high memory or high CPU just didn't work. So we thought about calling them like, you know how you get the resistors and you have the color codes and every little piece means something? So we toyed with doing that, but then that got complicated all of a sudden. So then we thought we'll just call them like A6 and A7. And at some point you can imagine we'll have A5 and A8 and 9 and 10 and... Yeah, and then, like and some of might, our other... We might switch to B at some point and there'll be no reason why we switch to the letter B. Well, you Probably. know, I think that it's... Who it's knows, we might change that in... in, in I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> I, you can just keep checking back on the instance sizes because, right, it's a commodity resource. There'll be a price associated. Yeah. Obviously, smaller is much cheaper than the yeah. extra large. That's just, that's really all you need to know at this point. And uh, let's go back to the demo and we can kind of keep rolling with the creation of our VM. Again, David mentioned that you need to not use admin or administrator. Imagine that, security is probably not the best idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you pick a username, pick a password, uh, which requires complexity. And then at this point, um, this is a little bit tricky on the verbiage that we have here, right? Because it's saying, hey, should we connect to a standalone virtual machine um, or uh, an existing virtual machine? And what I think it, it should be called, and I've heard it might be changing, uh, is that standalone is kind of like, hey, a new virtual machine and a new cloud service, or connect to an existing virtual machine might be called, hey, connect to an existing um, virtual network and an existing cloud ser a cloud service, right? So you kind of, you know, it gives you a little bit of context there, but we're going to go ahead and just choose the standalone virtual machine because we don't already have a cloud service created for us. And as David mentioned, you know, this will go ahead and do that for us right here. So we'll say, David, uh, that's definitely going to be taken. <laughs> David, <laughs> David Cloud Service. Uh, let's see if that that is up. Oh, David Cloud Service. It is okay. And now at this point, right? If you did not, if you hadn't already created a storage account, the automatically generated one is going to give you a bunch of portal and a bunch of goop after that, right? But because we went ahead already earlier and created a storage account, we'll choose David Storage Demo. And we already created, right, the David VNet earlier. And there we were going to have the option to choose the one subnet we created under the David VNet. And with that, we'll just click Next, OK? Availability set we'll get to in a minute, as well as the yeah. PowerShell remoting. So I'm not going to cover this so yeah. that David can cover it next. But we'll, we'll click uh, Complete on this. And then we're firing up a virtual machine, all right? Um, <clears throat> That virtual machine um, is going to have, uh, right, once you go into the virtual machine console and you click on, let's say, one of the VMs after this one uh, gets provisioned, you have the ability to see, right, the status of the cores, which, which particular disks that virtual machine is using. Is it using an OS or a data disk? How many cores is it, is it using? 
And then um, you also notice this thing here, uh, which says 20 cores. 20 cores. 20 cores is not enough. Is 20 it? cores. We need, we don't, more, we cores. need more cores. Oh, Give me more cores, cores. So right? I'm going to help you get more cores. And you're going to do this. And I'm going to talk you through this. That is hardcore. It's hardcore. <laughs> that is more hard, that's more core. That's Careful. more core. All right, okay. So if you click on your, your name on the, the, the poll on that. Okay, and, and up we'll, here. We'll click yep. on the demo machine there, yeah. And you can see that there is a contact support. Okay, let's I'm, see. I'm sure my eyes are. I see, don't yep. see contact that part, support. We'll click on that. Oh, there we go, so, yeah. The reason why we have these limits is is partly to protect us and partly protect you, right? We we don't want to kind of let you go and create ten thousand cores because a you'd have to pay for them and b let's assume someone stole your credit card and signed in as you or something and and then all of a sudden you get a bill for ten thousand cores over the weekend you're going to be a little bit unhappy. So we have these limits in and you've basically got to open a support ticket um, to to get those limits removed. Now it's easy to go a little bit past twenty. Um, we're, we're good with that. But if you say, hey, I want, I want 100,000 cores, we might kind of have a conversation with you because that's <laughs> a lot of cores. Um, but also we want to make sure that you know, we help you with the, the architecture of your application, make sure you're doing the right thing in the right data centers and, and all that kind of thing. So you know, we're there to help you um, essentially. But if we flip back to the demo machine and follow through this, there's an option there to, to, for which type of um, support and if we choose billing, Okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> yep, that's the easiest way to do it. And you can see at the bottom it says um, your, your support plan. So we are using internal Microsoft um, subscriptions, so that's the only plan we get. And, and quite frankly, we just call up the developer and say, hey. Um, but for a quarter, we still go through the same procedure. So if we click on open a ticket or create a ticket, it's going to open a new browser window and take us directly to the Microsoft support site. And it's going to fill in a bunch of things for us. Um, on there. Um, and if we just drop down, and what the first thing should be quarter increase. Yeah, I see that, that there. And we'll select that. Okay. And then it will give us another option, and compute is what we want to increase. So we'll click on continue. And then we, we won't go through the whole kind of thing, but essentially it's going to ask us a, a set of questions of, is this critical? Do you need us to respond really super quickly? You know, is it a sev A, sev C? How many cores would you like and that kind of thing. So right. you kind of work through there and then a couple hours later um, or less or, or more depending on you know, what's going on, um, you'll get that quarter increase approved. Support typically reach out and ask you know, where are you going to deploy this stuff. And, and this helps us capacity plan and, and you know, running an efficient cloud is always a balance between having available capacity and making sure we're bringing on things um, as needed. So, you can quit out of that. We won't. We yeah, won't we're that. not gonna. I don't. I don't need more not, cores. Not in the actually. four minutes that we so, have left. Yeah, not in the four minutes we have left, and we still got some other things to cover here. <laughs> so uh, let's let's go back and finish up on a, on a few things. We'll kind of hit really quickly here. Uh, that is important to bring up. Let's see. We have. We have uh, a number of different things for support because one of the other logical questions that you get asked after this is. Uh, what what is what roles what are supported right okay yeah you have Windows Server on there but can you run everything within Windows Server well not necessarily um, it really kind of depends right for instance if you wanted to run Hyper V on a VM inside of Windows Azure that wouldn't really work right because you can't run virtualization inside of virtualization just the way of the nature of things if you have this is a list of some of the applications and things that we support definitely this is always evolving right so we have a support link there. Hey, does it does it run X Y Z for Windows whatever workload you want? Is it officially supported? That is your link. I will also say that there's a number of workloads that aren't listed there that I know we're working on testing, and just because it says that it's not officially supported doesn't mean that it won't necessarily work. It just means that we haven't certified it to run on Windows Azure at this time. Okay. With that, also I wanted to bring up we showed you the core sizes earlier. Right, uh, the, the thing that isn't really visible in the console is that there's a bandwidth and a number of data disks associated with yeah. which particular size virtual machine you want. Just be aware of that and plan accordingly. Um, and then also for licensing, and this is one of the really unique things that, that is uh, differentiating uh, for us is the fact that if you run Windows Server, you don't have to pay for a Windows Server license. You pay for just the compute usage in your environment and 
don't worry about the licensing. You get a data center edition of Windows Server, do whatever you want with it. As long as you're paying the hourly charge, you're covered. Um, other applications and all other kinds of crazy licensing questions, definitely go to the link because <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna answer all of those right now. L uh, licensing's below subnets for me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we're gonna talk uh, about images. All right. And there's there's two types of image images or disk and images are different, but they are, they are kind of related. OS images are things that you want to have as a template to deploy, right? You as an IT guy are familiar with sysprep, right? When you sysprep an image, you know that that's now a template you can spin more images up with. Same deal with Windows Azure, right? It's the same exact concept, we're just doing it in the cloud in that you have an image that you're available to deploy at your own will um, using our cloud services. Uh, to, to build whatever you need to build inside of Windows Azure uh, infrastructure services. And then disks, disk is a little different in that if you go to up, upload, let's just say, a VHD into blob storage, right, it's, not, it's just going to be a VHD chunk there. You, ha you have to tell Windows Azure specifically that it needs to be a disk in order for you to be able to do something with it, right, attach it to a virtual machine. That is, that is uh, what's a little bit unique there. Um, I'm going to now go to the demo of creating, creating an image inside of Windows Azure. So let me uh, switch to that now. And there's a number of really good articles here if you want to do this yourself. So if you want to go back to my demo machine, um, there's a couple of articles that are in the slides that you have uh, for, for your use. I've, I've already went in and, and created a... Um, a virtual machine. So, hold on here. Security, right? Timing out. That's what we have to deal with. So let's go to the portal. And I have a virtual machine that I've already went in and created. I'm going to go down to this list and just connect up to it. This is a virtual machine that um, it says image me, right? <laughs> when I go here, I'm going to add, let's say, the web role to it. If it's going to respond. It's not responding, so I'm going to disconnect and just reconnect via the, the RDP file here. This is another tip for you if you start to manage a number of different machines. Ideally, once you get to a certain scale, you're probably going to want to use PowerShell, <laughs> but in the short term, what you could use is a number of RDP files. In my case, right, I have an RDP file saved on my desktop. And uh, so I'm going to log into this machine here, and we're going to run uh, this PowerShell command to install uh, the web service or the web role. Um, and actually, why don't I give you the, the fancy uh, the PowerShell ISE <laughs> for those folks who are not familiar with it to install the role. And while that's coming up, one of the other things you need to do is run sysprep, right? So if we yep. go into sysprep, uh, we type run, and that's just going to come after we customize our image. Uh, let's we go to C backslash Windows backslash system32 sysprep, and then there we have the sysprep uh, image, which will be ready for us here in a second. And uh, of course, I need to customize the image because at this point, there's no reason to generalize or create an image because I've done nothing to the base <laughs> Windows Server gallery image, right? You'd just be spinning your cycles for no apparent reason. But uh, what I'll do is I'll do install Windows, and you notice that the IntelliSense pops up there for installing a Windows feature. I'm going to install the Windows feature, and I'm going to type the name, and we're going to use the, the web role, the web server role because we might want to run a web server here. And we're going to include the management tools for IIS for that. We click, we fire that off. Uh, hold on here. Web, web, web SER is probably not a, a valid command. Uh, server, there we go. So we're installing the web server role, all right? I, at this point, after it installs, I'm not going to make you wait for this to install because we're running uh, late on time here. But uh, all, what you need to know here is you, after this is customized and installed, what you would do is go in, click Shutdown, click OK, and at that point, it's going to generalize your image, shut it down, and I already have one baked. Imagine that. 
<laughs> I already have an image baked, and then we'll go back into the console here. Okay, we'll go into our console and show you what that looks like. So here, under virtual machines, I've got web image. And it needs to be shut down in order for you to be able to do this, okay? Um, but when it is shut down, you have the ability to, to capture that image uh, in, your, in your list. So when we go through this, it um, finishes coming up here, has to retrieve the status of that image that's there. Um, while it's waiting on that, why don't I show you in the virtual machine from gallery where that shows up at, right? Because in, when you go to new image from gallery, you can go to all my images, and th at that point, you're going to have that list, that image come up there. Okay, and it will also show up in a number of other places, but it looks like this is uh, having a hard time retrieving its status for some reason. Yeah, yeah. So. Anyway, uh, at that point, all you need to do is hit capture. It would save it as an image. And then inside of the image, what you're going to have is um, um, some, that list there. And you'll notice here that we have a VM depot for all of these various Linux images. We can copy down greater than what you see in the gallery. And then we also have, um, I copied right, a LAMP stack image down earlier just for, for giggles, right? <laughs> so just so you can see that it's there. Um, we have one last section. I think that, that, that really covers quickly the imaging. And again, go to those labs that'll explain in more detail yeah. on how to do that. And then finally, I want to touch on managing VMs. All right, and uh, there's one slide I have for that. And it, it's really important, a point and point to bring out. Because the thing as an IT guy, right, you think about is, hey, I've got these VMs up there, and now what do I do? Uh, how, what yeah. do I need to? What do I need to do to keep them running? Because it's this weird thing, right? It's all up there in Windows Azure. How do I deal with that? And um, what I want to show you, if you switch to the slides, is that it's really no different than just extending your data center, yeah. right? And so, in which case, you've got, let's say, you open up that site-to-site -site VPN tunnel. At that point, right, it's no different than just having a separate branch office. Of, of your company somewhere else that's connected over the network and you've got virtual machines running there. Yep. And the example that you have here, you see System Center Configuration Manager, that's what you use to manage your existing network. It could be Tivoli, it could be whatever, you know, whatever product you use to manage your servers. It's fine, right? It's just like an extension of that network. It's a, just a virtual machine. You install that same management agent you're used to on the, on the Windows server or whatever machines you're used to and it can do that. The alternative, the, the second option you have up, up top here when you see the, uh, the PowerShell remoting is, is, is being able to connect up to the virtual machines using remote PowerShell yeah. over the internet. <laughs> that sounds scary, but we do have enough. We've thought yeah, about we, that. We, we thought, we've about, thought about that, and there's a number of security things we put in place to make that uh, a, a safer uh, option for you to be able to do the management. And David's going to dig into that next. So stay tuned. And that kind of gives you all the fundamentals that yeah. you need to know. So we'll Great. be back in about 10, 10 minutes, minutes or so. Brilliant. Thank you.